Okay, while well, Melissa gets this kind of up and running here, this is uh, this first picture that showed up is sort of, I don't know, it was sort of the, it was the milestone of our race this year. This was right after the Rhone checkpoint. And this was a bit of a stretch of water across the river that it was basically, it was just open water. It was created partially from overflow and uh, as we crossed, the closer it got to the opposing bank, there was actually running water on top of the ice that had formed beneath it. Um, so for those of you that aren't familiar with overflow, overflow is created basically when you have a body of water that's frozen, um, lake, stream, river, whatever the case might be, and then it snows and the weight of that snow presses down on the ice and cracks it and then water will seep up through those cracks and essentially try to refreeze on the top. <clears throat> so in this particular case, we were kind of having to bust through that ice, hoping that there was a bottom crusted <laughs> layer below us to keep us sink into the bottom. Interestingly enough, like later on that night, as we're riding through this, what they call the farewell burn section, we came down this hill onto another stretch of river and we, we came across a buffalo that it didn't have as fortunate a luck and it kind of collapsed through the ice and then got stuck and froze there and so he didn't make it sort of sad to see but I mean, it's kind of treacherous out there you had to be careful anyway it's kind of an iconic picture sort of sort of interesting um but so everybody does anybody have any questions just to start before we even get going with this whole process does anybody is there anything that anybody would like to ask right from the get-go Okay, so for let's see what what time what time of the day was the video from? So that particular that first video there was it was probably early afternoon. I would say probably like around one o'clock or so. Um, the thing that makes you know a lot of stage races or ultra races or whatever the case, or ultra races I guess I should say unique is that you know you sort of lose track of the days. Um, because they're not traditionally dictated by sun up or sundown or dictated by like when you leave your checkpoint or when you had your last sleep. And it's important to learn to think in that context um, because the, the window for riding in a lot of cases, like this year, we had, a, you know, pretty warm temperatures for the most part on uh, the trail gets soft during the day and uh, it's harder to ride. So at night, the trail freezes up a bit and it gets a little bit easier to navigate under the, in those circumstances. Um, so the better part of the day for us to ride was was at night in most cases. So you'll see a lot of the videos here are either at or close to close to night. Um, yeah, but so that's when that was taken. And that was, like I said, shortly after the Roan checkpoint, maybe just a couple of miles out. Is Roan like halfway? Roan is, yeah, Roan's about 180 miles, I guess, into the deal. Yeah. Uh, so, so a little better than halfway. We had about 120 or 130 miles to go from Roan to the finish, which we broke down for ourselves into well, the next 80 miles from Roan to Nikolai, uh, from Roan to Nikolai, which was the next checkpoint was 80 miles. And we had to sleep in between. And then uh, we made it from Nikolai to McGrath the following day, which was the finish line. Um, so for those of you that aren't familiar with, uh, ITI, ITI stands for, I did a ride trail invitational. Um, there's a lot of history behind how the race came to be, uh, in its initial form with the dog sled and the dog teams, um, and some of the things that they accomplished. So if you're not familiar with that, um, I would say, look it up because it's kind of neat how it all came to be. Um, and, and there's just some extraordinary individuals, uh, that have, participated in that throughout the years um our race the iti iti or iditarod trail invitation was broken up into two classifications there's a 350 mile version which is what jen and i did this year and uh, like melissa had touched on there's a thousand mile version um which you, you just continue on after you've reached that 350 mile mark you continue on from mcgrath to Nome. um and uh so it's available to uh, people by bike, by ski, or by foot. And so you'll see, you know, people that will complete like all three events uh, 
by bike, ski, or foot. Um, you know, pick your poison. Um, and uh, there are various checkpoints along the way that are mandatory. Um, and then there are also uh, there are also people that have them like cabins or village uh, uh, cabins or uh, resorts or uh, 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 small homes that will make themselves available to you along the route. But these trails that we're on, I use the word trails loosely. These are a lot of, you wouldn't be able to complete this route in the summertime. It's a lot of swamp country and river sections. The first, uh, the first 25 miles, you're doing a lot of overland stuff. But then after that, you know, up until Squantna, which is at mile marker 85 ish. So 60 miles essentially of river. Um, and if that river weren't froze, then you wouldn't be able to, you just wouldn't be able to get through. Um, the Yentna River. Yeah, that would be the Yentna, Yentna River. Um, so, uh, you know, the checkpoints are, uh, and these checkpoints are there because they're just smaller little communities. And when I say communities, it could be like a, a, an extended family, you know, that, that takes up two or three cabins, you know, within a three quarter of a mile stretch down the river or, you know, it could be fishing guides that have, you know, lodges and lodges mean different things, kind of depending on where you're at there. Um, from a five star luxury resort, which they actually do have, believe it or not, we did not partake in, but they are, there There was one available or, you know, all the way down to basically a little, you know, hunter type cabins or, uh, that are, you know, somebody's home that they've made available a couple of rooms for rent um, to get in and out of the cold if you want. There's a couple of safety cabins along the way too. A couple of safety cabins, yeah, and they use the safety cabins. These trails are there, you know, not for for fun, but these trails are there for hunters and for the villagers to get from point A to point B. Um, and so they set the trails every year, you know, with snow machines, so that they can commute back and forth for supplies. You know, the bare necessities of life, fuel, uh, um, food, um, those type of medicines, those types of things, and uh, so they they blaze those trails in and uh and then we had the luxury of being able to enjoy all the hard work that they put in but at any rate so our, our ride is 350 miles did you stay together the entire way we did stay yes. together the entire way um originally i was signed up to do the thousand mile race this year um and then jen and i did a qualifier race it's at the iti so i did a trail invitational you truly you have to be abided you you apply and, and, and submit your application, but then it's a, there's a selection process that goes into it. So Jen and I had uh, partaken in a qualifying event um, in Idaho called the Fat Pirate Tire Pursuit and the Fat Tire Pursuit Camp a workshop put on by Jay Peterberry and his wife, Tracy. Um, Rebecca Rush, uh, if any of you are familiar with her work, she was also um, one of our coaches this year at camp, Kevin Emery who has a tremendous amount of experience um, in, in multiple regions, but particularly in cold weather stuff in Antarctica, um, he was there. Uh, so Jen was able to get qualified by doing the camp and then doing so well at the race that uh, she was selected to be able to do the 350 this year. So rather than be split up and, and ride at two different paces and we do the thousand mile race, we, I decided at the last minute literally like the last minute <laughs> to do, uh, to just ride the 350 mile ride with her. So we stayed together the, the entire time. Um, Jen broke a lot of the trails. She kind of led out in front and then that way we were able to kind of clip along at her pace and made sure that it was something that was going to be manageable for both of us. It doesn't do well in that environment to get too far ahead of your teammate. Uh, you can't really be standing around and Incremental yeah. weather like that, you'll just you'll freeze. You kind of got to keep moving when you're out and about. Um, yeah, so so we did stay together and and had a good time for it. Um, you know the motivations in a lot of ultra events are sort of different, honestly, than than motivations at the Iditarod. Motivations in the Iditarod are simply like you. It's so big in the scope of it and what you're trying to accomplish that you have to break it down into 
what are seemingly just ridiculously small bits, you know, and it always starts out with, well, what is your goal or objective for the day? So the goal or objective for the day, it varied each day, but for the most part, it was to get from this checkpoint to that checkpoint, or if that gap was too large to cover to make it a reasonable distance so that we wouldn't have as far the following day to make it to the checkpoint. Um, and then you, you, break it down into smaller increments from there um you know like like we want to get to a, a picture of a bridge just came up that was we'd stopped and we'd had some water that we'd boiled from the night before uh, that morning before rather and we used that water there at that bridge to heat up some lunch and have a dehydrated meal there at the bridge and that was our goal for you know the or morning motivation as it were for you know five hours to get to that bridge so and that we could stop and drink some water out of drink some water out of that creek that you didn't that have was to, sullivan creek yeah you didn't have to melt snow to be able to drink some water so. <laughs> yeah what did you eat pack for fuel. fuel so so the way that it works out are that there are um, at some of the checkpoints, there are some things that you can buy um, from some of the people that run proprietorships. Um, there are also, for the 350 mile route, there are also uh, two, uh, two places where you can mail drop bags to. And those drop bags, you're allowed to have up to five pounds in, but it's just consumable items. So you're allowed to mail like hand warmers and then food items. So and batteries and batteries. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and batteries. So we mailed uh, all of our food ahead, you know, and we kind of pick things that we like just generally when we're riding, you know, and, uh, but, you know, for me, like it's a lot of nuts and trail mix and, uh, snacks and I like some of you know the like peanut M and M's are a big thing for me. Um, Reese's, peanut butter cups, those types of things. Whatever you're gonna pick in a fashion, like, like in that regard, you just need to make sure that it's not gonna freeze um, because it's a rotating process. You'll take your food from whatever bag you have it stashed in on your bike, and then you'll move it to your body to warm it up. Um, before you can put it in your mouth otherwise you, you know you're just cheating. you might break a tooth you might break it <laughs> might break a tooth ruin anybody's day um and then we did take some dehydrated meals uh some pre-packaged uh, a lot of heather's choice meals which are really good they have a lot of good things in them yeah um and then you know we made up some some different stuff of our own like i made up a few bags with some so top stuffing and some top ramen in them and i mailed those ahead um, the things that will hydrate well that are going to fill you up and, and keep you warm, um, warm the inside and, and, and not be afraid to stop. That's the biggest thing is that, you know, like, and even in a lot of other races, it's like you pick certain times of day when you feel like you need to stop and when you're going to stop to eat. But like literally in a race like this, uh, just because it's so big and so extreme and so so long in its duration like you just have to communicate between one another you know and and that's kind of a good thing we ride together so much that like I could tell if you know if Jen's wanting to take a little bit of a break or she can tell if I if I want to take a little bit of a break and you know we just kind of communicate back and forth and I mean, it's hard to fight over foods <laughs> <laughs> so you just sit down and eat, eat something and then when you climb back on you're in a better mood for it you know and it's cool because it gives you an opportunity to sit and look at some of this stuff, you know, that you've just been blowing by and kind of take it all in and, and uh, enjoy not your that, surroundings. Not that you really move at a fast pace. No, out no. There. Yeah, the trail <laughs> conditions slow. dictate your speed. I mean, if you're going, if you're going for five miles an hour, you feel like you're accomplishing well, a lot. Yeah. There's a lot of times when you're clipping along at, you know, two, three miles an hour. Or you're pushing. Or pushing for some pretty decent distances and spans as well. What was the hardest day? Hardest day. What was the hardest day? You know, the I think that honestly, believe it or not, the hardest day was probably the first day. Yeah. Yeah, uh, me too. And you know, the thing is, is there's so much anticipation and so much lead in going into the ride. And just like anything, you set objectives and goals and and like, but that's a real that plays with your mind a lot. Um, leading up to the race there was just a lot of unusually warm weather conditions and the trail wasn't set real well um, and then there had been a lot of snow like the week before so 
um, you know, I say, I say trail, but the, the thing about it is, is that like, you're responsible for your own navigation. There isn't a GPX file that's handed out like at most uh, ultra events. Like you have to find your own way of go going. Like it doesn't matter how you get from checkpoint to checkpoint. It just has to be, it has to be self-powered. You have to get there on your own and you can pick whatever means available, which for the most part, once you get past the first 25 to 30 miles, is a relatively cut and dry scenario because you had those people breaking trail, you know, all winter long. And it kind of sets up to where some of these pictures you see, you look at, you're like, well, that's a great looking trail. And it is, it is in terms of at least navigation and navigationally speaking. But initially that first 25 miles is so close to, um, you know, township or whatever the case might be that there are a lot of people that still go out for the weekend and kind of blaze new trails and do things, do your wintertime activities and things out there. So there are several different routes that you can take to get to the first checkpoint, which is Butterfly Lake, but it's hard to know which ones are good. Like the route that I took last year was straight over the top of Big Lake, which is basically riding your bike right down the middle of the lake for seven miles which is the straightest, most direct point. But this year, there was so much overflow on the lake that it, you couldn't ride on it. Like they, they didn't have snow machines out on They had a couple of the, a few days before, but one of them sank to the bottom and there got stuck. So it just wasn't a good option. So, you know, you have that kind of weighing down on you a little bit, uh, not knowing exactly how you were going, you know, and like you can make a navigational error, pick the wrong path, you know, and then, you know, the next thing you know, in order to fix your error, it's a seven mile backtrack to get to you another place that'll divert you in a different fashion. So, you know, now you're talking about you wasted two hours to get to that point where you made a bad decision and then two hours back. So it just weighs on you mentally. And then it's always tough, you know, like our pay, our, our goal was to ride as slow as possible and to conserve our energy and to not fatigue ourselves you know or, or in go and go into the red you know and just stay as calm as possible and uh you know we we did we managed that very well but it's always tough in, a, in an race environment like that when everybody's pulling away from you and blowing by you you know and kind of leaving you in the dust and you know they're it, towards the tail end of uh reaching that first checkpoint you know it was a it was basically like an out and back for the last four miles so you're or I'm sorry, two miles in, two miles back out. So a total of four miles, but you're essentially riding by people, you know, uh, so you're just doing the math in your head. Oh, well, they, they're two miles farther than I am right now. And they took like a 20 or 30 minute break at the age stage. So you're thinking I'm already, you know, potentially an hour and a half to two hours behind from where that person. So you play those mental games. And I think that that was that was the biggest deal. It was, uh, and we made the decision on that first day to bed down relatively early. Um, the race starts like at two in the afternoon and we ended up going to bed. I think bedded down like it, it was probably like 1130 or 12 o'clock somewhere in there, which was relatively early and we could have pushed farther, but it just made better sense for us to kind of get a good night's rest and eat a little bit and, kind of reset ourselves for the following day i mean if we would have pushed farther we would have been on the river in the iti what was the last part of that question did you count anybody in the iti that what do you want to talk about that person who had to sos out? oh yes oh. so that so in that clip you know after you leave Rhone that's at about the 180 mile mark so the stretch from Rhone to Nikolai which is the next checkpoint is, is 72 miles I think it's about 72 74 miles somewhere right in there and you go through an area called the farewell burn and it was an area that had there was a fire there years and years decades ago and it just devastated the landscape but because it's such a harsh environment, nothing's really grown back there. They have wild bison that graze out there. And that's where like a lot of the villages, their hunters will go out there to hunt for, you know, whatever. But it's in the literally the middle of nowhere. <laughs> so so as we left Rhone, we dealt with that 
water crossing. So about 12 miles beyond that point, there was an individual. So when you cross through there, you, you, you go up over the top of a glacier, <laughs> which sounds like ridiculously <laughs> extreme and it's not quite that bad, but it, it certainly ain't good. <laughs> so you, you kind of go over this glacier and then down the other side. And, and as you start to go down the other side, eventually you come out to like these like lakes and swamps, swamps and that are froze. Like in, for us, when we went through there, it was pitch black. So you couldn't tell like whether what you were crossing was 50 feet wide or whether it was a mile wide and you're just kind of going along and you're looking for trail markers off in the distance that they might have like stuff stuck up which would signify a shoreline on the opposite side but you're kind of you're just going along and you can kind of hear the ice cracking underneath your bike as you're like scooting along and the wind is howling yeah <laughs> so about 12 miles after that roan section there was there was or the roan checkpoint there was one of those sections and there's a fellow uh, that we had actually passed the night before, and he'd been having some some trouble uh, coming down the Delzo Gorge. Yeah, he was just it was things were just getting kind of difficult for him. Well, apparently after we left Roan, uh, they left some hours later, and uh, he had crashed out there on the ice, and he like he ended up doing some broke some ribs broke some ribs and then like pulled his hamstring or his quad or something to the point where like he couldn't hardly get around so so they had to get him they had to get him rescued out of there and so so basically when you've got to get rescued it's not like a normal a normal scenario where they can just helicopter in to get you because like it just didn't gonna happen so the common sense scenario would have been to send in a sled from Rhone to go get him but it couldn't because by this point that water crossing that we went through the day previously was totally destroyed now and like they weren't going to get a snow machine or a sled across there so that meant that they had to send a rescue team from Nikolai back to McGrath and the rescue team essentially consists no, back towards Rhone. excuse me back oh. towards Rhone I'm sorry uh, so from Nikolai back towards Rhone uh, and the rescue team basically consists of their hunters. So that's the hunters that the village sends out to go hunt for the village. So like you've got three guys and three sleds pulling, pulling, you know, like these trailers kind of behind them, these sleds behind them to get, and they had to take three because if one guy got broke down, they had to be able to get like, they got to be able to rescue. Yeah. They got to be able to rescue their own selves. So <laughs> So they, so it took it five was, hours for them to go out. There. Yeah, five hours for them to get there from Nikolai, and then it ended up taking them six hours to get back to Nikolai once they picked him up. And they passed us going out because we were yeah. headed towards Nikolai. Yeah, we saw that. We saw yeah. him headed out to go fetch that guy. Yeah, we didn't even know. We just figured they were traveling across to go hunt or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so they, they ended up collecting him up and they took him back to Nikolai. And then like once you know you're you're in the remote village and there's you know, they have their their rules and regulations about kind of like how things get handled at those checkpoints. But essentially from the point that he was rescued, he was no longer considered to be a participant in the race. Um, and so those things that are available to racers at our checkpoints then or at I, the actual Iditarod checkpoints for the sled dog teams are no longer available to those private individuals. So, you know, now you're talking about a guy in a village that's, you know, no bigger than both your hands put together. And, you know, they found him, I think he ended up holding up like in a little, I don't know, like two room type place or whatever, and was able to get a flight out like a couple of days later. But, you know, you don't know, like when you're in those communities, whether you're going to get a flight a day from now, a week from now just kind of depends on air traffic is there anything you wish you had was there anything you wish you had what what was that next question was there anything what was sean's question again oh on, on your, your bike. bike um you know i don't know like our bikes were pretty well equipped like we pretty much had everything that we needed 
I particularly you had, had too much stuff. I had a lot be, <laughs> because again, like when I say that I made like a last minute decision to do the 350 mile route instead of the thousand mile, I made that decision on the bus on the bus ride to the start. So like I was loaded to go to Nome. So like I, when we loaded our bikes back in the, uh, when we loaded our bikes back in the, the box used to take them to the airport when I threw my bike on the scale at the airport, like it weighed 83 pounds. <laughs> I mean, like I had a 20, <laughs> uh, you, you know, but there again too, like I, even at the start, I mean, there was a chance for me to reorganize some things and maybe dodge some stuff and get rid of some stuff or send it back to the hotel. And I, I mean, like when you have it out there, you know, you're, you're happy to have it, you know, and you, I mean, it ends up being a little bit of a junk show sometimes for me because I don't have enough time to practice in colder weather environments. So I do find myself from time to time looking around for things, which is not a good habit to get into. And I need to kind of clean that up a little bit. Um, but it was also semi amusing that after like three days out on the trail, you could open up a bag and dig around a little bit and find something and be like, oh, so <laughs> it's kind of like Christmas a few times a day. Yeah, I was, ha I was happy with mine. I had everything that I needed mm -hmm. and not too much. I think that, uh, so the question is, do you think this year was easier? There were things about, I, I mean, compared to last year, for me, it was a lot easier. And I, I kind of gone through that a lot in my mind and tried to think about why that is. And I feel like, I feel like it was easier this year First of all, this year was a different route than last year. Um, last year was more or less like a COVID edition. So there wasn't the thousand mile option. That means that everybody essentially was doing the 350 mile route. So last year, the route was basically from the start to Rhone and then from Rhone back to the start. So it was just an out and back where this year, the road, the 350 mile route was the traditional route. And that went from obviously the start all the way straight through to McGrath. So I felt that the, the overall, like there wasn't the huge temperature swing this year. I mean, honestly, there were a couple of times when uh, the temperature got, you know, minus five, I think maybe even minus 10 one day to Fahrenheit. But for the most part, the weather was pretty extraordinary in terms of temperature. Um, we did experience some wind and some snow when we were uh, going up over Rainy Pass. Um, and that was a little bit challenging, but uh, no, nothing more than nothing more than you'd normally expect. Um, uh, at any rate, so like this year, I felt like it was easier, but I don't know that it necessarily had as much to do with the, the, the temperatures. It just had to do with me personally knowing what to expect i mean there's obviously a certain comfort level and knowing what each checkpoint is about and you know having some comparison with your experience from a previous year and and uh and honestly like it was so relaxed for us maybe that was the other thing so it, we just took it so easy uh and, and we were just you know just out there to enjoy the experience and we had no goals or expectations i mean they give you 10 days to get to mcgrath and when we were fully prepared to take all 10 days if we needed to you know we ended up finishing in six days and some hours and legitimately could have been under six days had we pushed a little bit but neither one of us really i mean like when you get that close to the finish you want to be done but then a certain part of you starts thinking about, well, then what am I going to do? You know, <laughs> yeah. and like you, you learn to accept your circumstance for what it is. And it's one of the simplest forms of living that a person could possibly do. When you know that you literally have everything on your bike to sustain yourself for an extended period of time under any circumstance, I mean, it's, you feel so accomplished and it feels like such an achievement. And you, you kind of just don't want it to be over. You just kind of want to be able to keep after it and, and just yeah. enjoy it for what it is. So, um, as far as where I sleep, <laughs> so was it, yeah, it was kind of like a vacation. Like a, think of it like a honeymoon, man. <laughs> 
without so much of the intimacy. <laughs> so the sleeping bag, like our sleeping bags, you know, we took a minus 40 sleeping bag because you have to be prepared for there's some guys, you know, that'll go out and they're, they're like legitimately racing it and they're like they're wicked fast. fast. So those guys will race with like a 30 degree sleeping bag and like nothing hardly, you know, and they'll blow through that thing. And you look at their bike and it looks like you're out for, you know, a day ride practically. Um, but, you know, I mean, we, we realize that we're not as fast and we're certainly not 20 years old. So like we take the things that we feel comfortable enough with to and be able to work through a bad situation. Live out there, yeah. yeah. And so like our sleeping bag, we had a minus 40 sleeping bag, both of us. And it, I mean, that, th that's a legitimate concern. Like you got to be careful that you don't get too warm at night, you know, because like you can, you can start to build up a little bit of sweat in that bag, which is, you know, that's the, that's a situation just all day long. You're constantly, I mean, it's probably, you know, without exaggeration, 20 to 30 times a day that you're on your bike and off your bike to strip layers or to reapply or to move some layers around, but you do whatever you need to do in order to make yourself comfortable. The other thing that's nice is that like, if you're going through that personally, generally speaking, your ride partner is also. So that's a good opportunity to just kind of get off your bike and, and you grab a snack because it's not like it's really easy to eat while riding on yeah that yeah bike. <laughs> yeah you have to stop to eat pretty much you're not going to eat on the fly so a couple of the pictures that have popped up here these are pictures that are on the plane on the way back oh it was really cool flying over the route because yeah to get to see what we had just traveled across yeah the, it was really cool yeah so when you get to mcgrath it's like it's basically it's just a small little airport and the plane that we were on was a little four-seater plane that uh the the iti uh that the 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 race people they basically rented planes and shuttled us back to anchorage uh uh, and then at that point, you know, you get whatever back to your hotel or whatever to collect all your personal possessions. But the pilots, you know, as, as a private pilot, you know, they kind of essentially just took us almost exactly over the same, the route, the same route that we went in on. So it kind of gave you an opportunity to, to, like get back. to look at the, to look at the stuff uh, that, that you'd had to deal with, you know, and then like when you're out there doing it, you're like, gosh, this seems like this is like a big deal. And then like when you're coming back over it in a plane and you're looking at all of it, you're like, that oh is gosh. a big deal. That's oh, a really big deal. Plane ride back. The, uh, the, uh, so our bikes came back a couple of days later, again, smaller villages. And so they have like, they have, you know, uh, uh, shipping companies or whatever that will haul stuff in and out of the villages. So it came back on a, on a big transport plane, like all the bikes and all the sleds and everybody's gear got loaded up onto these, uh, onto these, uh, uh, onto the plane and then got shipped back to the cargo airport in Anchorage. And then we personally took an Uber from the hotel to the airport and then collected up our bikes and just rode our bikes back to the hotel from there. Um, so, and, but it was, it was really well done. It was well done the way that they did it. Uh, so, so curiously enough, so the, when you get to McGrath, we stayed at a lodge there. And, and again, this is essentially just a great big house. I mean, think about like a, like a six bedroom house and, uh, with, with a big common area on the other side of the building and it has a ginormous garage. So all of these bikes get packed into this ginormous garage and you write your name on there on some tape and stuff like that. So the, the, the volunteers uh, for the, for Iditarod, for the ITI, they had to ride. And the race director. Yeah, and the and race director wife. and his wife. Yeah, they had to ride all those bikes like two miles a bit down to the, to the little airport or whatever down take them to the to get on the cargo to get plane. on the cargo plane to get shipped back to Anchorage yeah. so I mean they, they probably put in a hundred miles <laughs> themselves riding all those bikes down to the airport just getting them all loaded up but it was cool you know and then they, they'd send you little pictures and they'd be like oh your bike put it down there that's was kind of, <laughs> kind of cool and neat so the, the airplane ride back so another question was how was your airplane ride back so it was super duper cool super small plane 
but like you know you're just taking it all in because you know that that is the legitimate last of the experience that you're going to get like as soon as you're playing lands and anchorage it's it's done like it's you'll never find people that understand the experience unless they've actually done it, unless they've been able to partake in it so like your world like your your community of your fellowship is just really small and it's it's over and i think that that is the huge attraction for so many people to want to go back year after year after year the accomplishment is tremendous the experience is whatever it is that you take out of it personally physically emotionally mentally whatever it is that you get from that experience there are a handful of people that are going to be able to to share into that and the same way that you did and uh and so it's it's one of those things that are like as soon as that point hits the tarmac and you're back in anchorage you know that it's going to be over so we were we we're happy to take it all in the plane that we were on though was kind of unique in that the door didn't lock all the way so <laughs> so you climb in and you kind of work this handle a little bit and the the pilot pushes on the door a few times from the outside and you get this handle about as good as you think it's going to get and then you take this bungee cord and you run it from right. the from the handle up top all around the door handle and then down kind of hook it at the bottom and He's like, well, if it looks like it starts to rattle loose, he's like, just kind of tug on a little bit. He's like, but it probably won't like fly open because, you know, I mean, we'll be going like 130 mile an hour. So yeah, I ought to keep the door pushed back for the most part. <laughs> but you're kind of like looking at the door handle and you're like, well, I guess if this is how, we're, how it ends, I guess that's just the way it's meant to be. But, but the view is spectacular, the, the, you know, the camaraderie. Um, you know, we rode back with two other racers, uh, one Jill Homer, who's just an accomplished endurance athlete in her own right, and has, has written several books on her adventures and a few of them particular to the ITI. I highly encourage anybody that has goals or aspirations of going to Alaska to do the Iditarod. I'd highly suggest that you look up Jill Homer, read her books, because, again, an extraordinary athlete and fights a lot of demons personally and does just an amazing job in dealing with that stuff and uh and gives you a lot of just insightful information and then there was another gentleman who actually i rode off and on with a bit last year who did the 350 last year as well uh, his name is forrest he's a local guy and he he skis it every year like he does it on his on his skis so that just always amazes me those guys pulling those sleds behind him navigating that same terrain on a pair of cross country skis, I think is extraordinary too. But, you know, you're sharing those experiences with them, you know, it's just another opportunity to be able to spend time uh, with people that like-minded people are doing amazing things. So that was, that was the journey home. When did I say, <laughs> yeah, well, I, so the process was, you know, like, I, so for me, like I, my training schedule, like I try to get like super, every, every year I set goals for myself and I make this ridiculous training schedule that, uh, that, that, I, that I'm never going to be able to live up to just with my work schedule and life demands or whatever. But nevertheless, I, I, I set this ridiculous training schedule and kind of clawed through it. And then typically, you know, when I'm three to four months out from like an event, I, I there's I grab onto one ridiculous thing that I'm just gonna do and I'm gonna because it might be the only thing that I could do so this year it was that I didn't shave from like October up until the time that I did the race and because I like I convinced myself that I need to have all that facial hair to keep myself warm which was ridiculous but that's what I latched on to so I was pretty good about not shaving up until the point when uh, we got back to Anchorage and then the very next morning uh, I downloaded the Uber app on my phone and I got in the Uber vehicle and I went down to the barbershop and, and I sat down in the chair and I said to the lady, I said, I was, was wanting to get a shave. And she's like, and get my hair cut. And she's like, oh, she's like, I can't shave that here. She's like, we don't have a straight razor. I'm like, well, just use those clippers on it. So it was as soon as we got back to Anchorage and I was happy to be rid of it because when you're trying to stick food in the face like that, it's not very friendly. <laughs> That's not very friendly. 
Uh, and the other oh, the other question was from, how do you train mentally and physically Doug, how do you train mentally and physically that's that's a great question and mm-hmm. I think that I think that training physically it, it's one of those things that we, we we obviously have the ability to do but it's it's a lot less controllable for me personally to train physically than it is to how I look at something mentally like and again it's it has to do with keeping everything for me personally keeping everything super simple so how good i'm going to be at an event and how fast i'm going to be at an event is all relative to my training but that's not a surprise when i show up on race day like i know if i'm not fit enough to be in contention for a top 10 finish and i know that i've left some things on the table so that's something that I'm willing to accept right then and there. I already laid the groundwork for my event months ahead of time. And if it's because I didn't get the work done and I didn't put in the time to train properly, then, then I accept that. And, and I feel like if you ha- come from an ultra endurance background, which, which I'm relatively new to and I've done some things, but it's not like I've been doing this for 40 years either. So like if you're relatively new to endurance stuff, set a realistic goal, but just understand what it is that you're physically capable of. If you're able to do that mentally, it makes everything else start to fall into place because now you've come to an event with a realistic outlook on what it is that you're capable of. And by the time you get to an event, you already know as a person that you're capable of some pretty amazing things, whether you want to believe it or admit to it or not, just the idea that you were able to think about tackling an event like this and to do all the legwork and to put all your ducks in a row and to show up at a start for a race like this or of this magnitude is extraordinary. So you just have to give yourself a lot of credit going into it and, and just be happy with where you're at and never, never expect more than what your body's prepared to give you. That being said, you know, have a lot of faith in your body because it could do some pretty amazing things that maybe you're not necessarily willing to give it credit for. Um, and, and, you know, like when you're in an environment with another individual being mindful of where they're at, like, you know, body, body position and the way that somebody acts when they're riding is is pretty key you know and like you can see like I can see it in Jen like if she's starting to get fatigued or tired or discouraged or let down because her pace will fall a little bit but it has to do with her confidence in the way that she rides you know and and I think that that's probably the same any of us and but acknowledge where you're at with that stuff you know and know that so many of the mental hurdles that you're going to overcome like in a winter ultra event you can fix with food. <laughs> like if you, if you think that you're just in a really bad, dark place, just eat some food, eat food. Cause it makes <laughs> no, everything better. better. Or have a hot drink or a hot oh, drink. Yeah. Cause we'd have hot tang. Yeah. They give us hot tang at the checkpoints. Oh, that makes you feel so much better. We'd fill our thermoses and off we'd go. And every time you're getting low on energy, have a drink of hot tang and yep. you feel good yep you'd be riding along and, <laughs> and i'd say tang break and you'd be like yep tang break so we'd have to stop and have a drink of tang and a snack and, and it's kind of cool too so the other good thing about riding with somebody is that like the the one common mistake that everybody makes and i don't know how it's unavoidable like and I'll, I'll probably make it again a hundred more times is that you end up putting the same crap in each one of your drop bags mm-hmm. so you end up looking at the same food that you just had with you for the last 60 or 70 miles so before you know it like you're like man did I really think that I was going to eat like 73 <laughs> pounds of Pringles you know so like so so it is kind of cool because pretty soon like you're sharing food amongst one another like like you're making trade make trade <laughs> so you start you start trading with your ride companions out on a trail for different stuff the other interesting thing is that as you're going along and you get to the different checkpoints where there are drop bags any of those racers that have scratched from the race their drop bags then become community fair so there'll be a table set out at those locations and it's like a buffet table for junk food addicts and endurance cyclists and you can kind of find all kinds of random stuff out there 
on those tables that's kind of like worth eating or trying and they're like oh yeah kit kat looks good so you'll grab three of those or whatever but uh yeah so so the mental aspect of it i i think that for me mentally because i tend to be harder on myself like i try to mimic the not necessarily the conditions but i try to mimic the level of difficulty and ride expect and rides that i have at home so like if, if I know that I have to ride for that, I may have to ride for a 24 hour stretch, then I'm going to do that at home, you know? And if you don't have like a 24 hour stretch to where you can ride, then, you know, break it up and so ride, like, you know, ride like 12 miles out, sleep for a couple hours, two, three hours and ride 12 miles back. It's still a 24 hour ride. You just took a nap in between, but I try to duplicate those scenarios at home so that when I get to race there, or when I get out in that environment, I don't, I don't worry myself with unimportant things like, Oh my God, what if I have to ride for the next 24 hours? Cause I already know that I can do that. Um, so eliminate those hurdles and obstacles at home, any things that you, and that just gives you a huge boat of confidence going into a race like this, boost your confidence and have, and have faith in your ability to complete stuff. And, and, and that's just how I choose to train mentally for stuff like that. Yeah, and definitely us being from Arizona because no snow, but we have a sand wash out our back gate mm-hmm. and rode the fat bike in that a lot yeah. and trained in that. And that was really good because it does kind of simulate riding in that loose snow. And yeah. so, yeah, that was definitely good. Yeah, you learned some of the same things, adjusting air pressures and mm-hmm. redistributing weight on the bike. And I mean, like slogging along like on a 70 or 80 pound bike, you know, fully loaded. And when we carried a lot of gear, there are people, don't get me wrong, there are people that do the same ride might have a 50, 55 pound bike, but like we carried a lot of stuff um, and, and, and more than we had to have this year, but had the weather changed for the worse, for one, whatever reason, we would have been prepared and we, we wouldn't have been worried about ourselves. Uh, but you getting used to that weight, you know, and, and riding a loaded bike in that capacity uh, in a sandy wash, I mean, it teaches you a lot. It teaches and, you. Yeah, and then one day uh, we were going, and it was just like a lot of deep snow and sloshy, so we ended up having to drop the air in our tires because we were pushing, and it's like, well, let's drop the air in our tires, and then we could ride instead yeah. of push. Yeah. Yeah. There was, there were, yeah, there were points when we had our air pressure down to probably like two pounds, maybe three pounds of pressure. Yeah. You no, know? but again, if you toy around with those things at home, then you have the confidence to be able to do it. And, and, and you know, the thing is, is like, you could, you could push your bike, you know, and go a mile and a half an hour, or you could drop the air pressure and, right. and go and go two and a half miles an hour, you know? So it's not like you were making huge <laughs> speed, but at the end of the day, you're still a mile an hour faster than the guy that decided he was going to push. So it was a bike ride, not a, not a hiking event for us. Jason, didn't you have to tube your tire at the end? <laughs> yeah, well, I actually ended up having to do that at Roan. So, so we keep talking about Roan, Roan, Roan. It's, it's because Roan, like things just happen there. So like in order to get to Roan, you leave Pontilla, and uh, which is a checkpoint or an aid station checkpoint, I guess you should say, and you climb up Rainy Pass. And Rainy Pass, like you know, like if you start watching videos of the Iditarod and you look at it, like it's just it's iconic because it's it's amazing when you're up there. Uh, we rode up there. Uh, or, or pushed did a lot of pushing to the top of rainy pass we pushed up there at night um because the weather had kicked up and it started snowing and the wind was blowing pretty good you know probably 25 30 mile an hour and like i knew that the trail was going to get drifted in so we wanted to get to the top of rainy pass before it just got to the point where like we were going to be knee deep in snow um, and luckily we did because we heard like a lot of stories from people after us and that's exactly what happened. Like the trail got blown in and, and it was, it was brutal for them. So we're happy that we made that decision, but somewhere in the midst of like riding in all that low snow, I, coming down the Dalzell I didn't, Gorge. yeah, we were coming down the backside of rainy pass with the Dalzell Gorge and I didn't, 
adjust. I didn't think to adjust my air pressure. So like I'm riding down the cell and I must have crashed like 15 times coming down the cell. And I'm like, what is your deal? Like, why can't you stay on his bike? And then I'm like, man, something's got to be wrong. So I like took a look at my back tire and it was pretty well flat, like flat. So I aired it up and like I had fatty strippers in there and like not much sealant, but had fatty strippers in there. So I pumped it back up and rode a little while and went flat again, pumped it back. So I did that like five or six times. So when I got to Rome, like, and I got to really looking at it, I never did find out exactly what a leak was, but like you could tell that I just ran that thing flat for so long that like it chewed up the sidewall. And so I'm pretty sure I have like 15,000 leaks in the sidewall. So I just made the decision to go ahead and tube it at Roan, where like I had a, a little bit of a fiasco because I had like this old man mountain rack. We both do old man mountain racks to go on the back of our bikes. And that's where we have panniers and that's where we keep like our sleep kits. So, but it has a through axle. So it's a little bit of a pain in the butt. Cause like you got to disassemble the old man mountain rack in order to get your through axle out to get your wheel off. So I found like these two stumps that they had laying around there. And I propped up my bike, like on these two stumps off of the pedals. Cause I wasn't going to, I didn't want to flip it upside down and there wasn't any way I was going to like, like prop it up on anything without worrying about ripping the seat off of it at 80 pounds. So I, I just made the decision to prop it up there and then I pulled the wheel off and tubed it there and, and it lasted the rest of the trip. Like I didn't have any problems with that. It's that. still lasting. Yeah. It's still holding it right now. Like it's, it's sitting in the living room up against the wall. I go poke it every third day and I'm like, I'll be damn. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so I, I, I should have done a better job about checking my air pressure, like, after the first five crashes, but I was just bound and determined I was going to get down there. So 15 <laughs> crashes later, I'm like, huh. <laughs> but that was luckily the only mechanical that we had. Mm -hmm. um, there was a, so when we went through that water there and uh -huh. Rhone, like, we got to talking to a bunch of people at the end in McGrath, and a lot of people had trouble with their hubs freezing up and uh and their and their derailleurs getting froze and their cassettes like filled full of ice um but luckily like we had the best bike mechanic in the whole wide mark world buns. mark buns <laughs> so like he literally pulled all our bikes apart and like completely winterized them which is this huge ridiculous task list of stuff to do but basically we had to he had to press all the bearings out of the hubs and replaced all the bearings with minus 50 grease um redid our bottom brackets and blew all the blew all the old lube out of uh out of our shifter cables and put some minus 50 lube on the shifter cables just the amount of work that he had to go through to prepare these bikes ahead of time was ridiculous but as soon as we got to the water like we spun the we spun the hubs uh we spun the wheels and got all the water out that we could um, lubed them, lubed them you know, lube, yeah lubed the rear derailleur lubed up the cassette with minus 50 grease that we had ran it through the gears and and never missed a beat like didn't have any problems at all but everybody else that is a real thing everybody else that we out. talked to like they froze up and it was a it was a matter of whether it took them two or three hours to get it broke free while riding along or whether some of them just never like it took like till they got to the next checkpoint, we're able to do something to Nikolai. Like it wasn't a good situation for a lot of people. So we were very, very fortunate, but you have to be, you have to be proactive with how you're managing those situations out on the trail. And you like, I'm probably the worst bike mechanic on the planet. Uh, you have to have people that really know what they're doing and want to take the time to do things right for you. Otherwise, you know, you, you could be stuck in a real bad situation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Trisha's question. What was Trisha's question? What, what's our next events? Our next events. So let's see. We're going to do a little gravelly kind of ride here in a couple of weeks <laughs> uh, called Ride Across Arizona. And it starts like at the California Arizona border and then rides a bunch of dirt roads, gravel roads over to the New Mexico border. Um, we're going to do that together. That's that. Like, and then uh, pinions and pines. Pinions and pines, another like Arizona another ride. A couple weeks later. Yeah, a couple weeks later, we'll do that. Do, and both of those were done as a duo team. Yeah. And then um, I don't know from there, like I need to, 
Oh yeah, we're gonna go to JP J J Peterberry has he's puts on a gravel event up in Idaho. We'll do that in July. Um, and then I've got another. We'll do that ride in September over in Idaho. Fitzgerald. Fitz, Fitzjoy. Kevin Emery, who was one of our instructors at that camp, uh, he puts on a ride over there, um, which is super duper cool. You get to see a whole lot of whole lot of things in Idaho. We'll do that, and then I'm probably going to do a couple of 24 hour events. Probably AZT. <clears throat> I'll do some AZ. I'll do AZT in the fall, probably in October. It would just kind of that depends on the work schedule. Whether I I either want to do the 300 fast or depending on the work schedule, like I might do the 800, mm, but it's a little tougher for me to commit that much time that late in the year. Oh. <laughs> uh, thanks for joining us. It was really good having yeah. you. Is that Luke? Yeah. Thanks, Luke. Uh, if you have any questions or whatever, M Melissa could probably get our emails out and feel free to ask questions later on. Thanks for, thanks for joining us. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much it. Like every everything I'm doing, like right now, as dumb as it sounds, is going to be to start to prepare myself for next year. For lots Nome. of hiking. Lots of hiking. <laughs> lots of yeah, lots of hiking. Lots of pushing that big old heavy bike around, stuff like that. Do we have any other questions? Anybody else have any questions? Does anybody else have any questions, Sean or Doug? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think you guys covered a lot of ground. Yeah. That was awesome. Rambled, rambled for a long time. <laughs> um, does anybody have any? Is anybody interested in doing Iditarod or like winter ultra events or anything? To pipe in, jump on, ask, comment, or you know. if anybody thinks anything, Melissa could probably make emails available or whatever. You guys can reach out to us for sure too. Yeah. Well, you. Yeah. Thanks everybody for coming and. Um, yeah. so, so Doug had a question, Melissa. Oh, Doug. Uh, what What are good first winter events? I think that that's that's a really good question. Like, if you start to do the research and you look around, I'm I'm very much a people person, so I always kind of like feel like there are people that are just gonna like that you're gonna vibe with that you can kind of follow along and and learn from. For us. Uh, Jay, Jay Peterberry, he was kind of that guy. Like he, he's kind of, he's one of those people that like, he's from New Jersey, you know, originally, and he kind of has that accent, you know, and like he, he's just such, he's such an accomplished ultra athlete on his own. Like it was really kind of hard to take him at first, but he puts on an extraordinary event up in Idaho um, called Fat Pursuit. And leading up to that, he has Fat Pursuit Camp. Um, which is super cool because it's like a three-day experience where you essentially just show up with your fat bike and all of your 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 junk show and you know start putting it together day by day and you start working through the process and start talking about different things from you know how to fit up your bike and how certain things are never going to work and and how to use your stove and mm -hmm. and how to layer your clothing and you know, and the different things in all though that particular camp that he puts on is catered around how to be able to successfully get through his race, which is a few days after the camp. Um, it's still a, a great, great learning experience in, a, in a, an environment with a handful of other like minded people. And you get to see, kind of see everybody comes along sort of at a different pace. The cool thing about it is because you're working with other individuals in a camp environment, like, you know, there's a little show and tell uh, times when like, you'll take everything off your bike and talk about it. And, and, you know, you might make, Jay might make, or, and or Rebecca or Kevin or any of the other camp instructors might make uh, 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 suggestions on how you have things packed up or what to consider to try maybe differently you get to see how everybody else does their stuff too so they might tell you well you might want to think about trying something differently but right after they tell you that you'll get to see how four other people have done it so you just it's a great experience to get a lot of ideas and a lot of information really really fast and it's just a super cool event to participate in i mean like you're riding up in idaho like bordering yellowstone park yeah, like in the middle of winter that's extraordinary like you yeah. know when you did that deal you've done something like it's like Jay says, it's better to 
like for him, like he's completed and won like the ITI like several times, a 350 mile version and a thousand mile version. He's like, we have better training for Alaska in Idaho than they have in Alaska for Alaska. So, and there's a lot of legitimacy to that. So that's a great big, huge event, depending on your location. Um, there's another one, I think back in Wisconsin, Tuscobia, um, they have, uh, there's one in uh, Wyoming and Pinedale too, in March. Pinedale. Okay. Pinedale. Yeah. That'd be a good, that'd be a good one. So reasonably it sort of depends on where you're at. I would say just find something that makes, that makes sense to you, but in the ability to be able to learn a lot of stuff, to um, go to the camp. Yeah. Go to, to go to the camp was just extraordinarily huge for both of us. Yeah. Cause I don't think that if I hadn't have done the camp, I wouldn't have been able to complete fat pursuit or even think about doing I did a rod because yeah yeah it was out of my element and and it's a qualifier so Doug like if you have any interest or goals to ever think maybe about like going to Alaska or doing the I did a rod you know jump on their website and look on their deal they have a like a bunch of different qualifying races um on the ITI website um and and that will give you you know, regionally kind of, I think depends on, on where you're located, but they've got like a lot of races up in Alaska. If you're in the lower 48, that might not be as attainable. Um, they also, I did it actually puts on a winter camp of their own. Um, and that winter camp is an automatic qualifier. It's in California. California. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. So you're, so, you're a lot of the same situation as us. Yeah. You don't get too many snowy days. Uh, it, it, I would say go to JP's. I would say go to JP's or maybe even investigate that Pinedale race that Melissa has. Um, if you're looking to get, uh, if you're looking to, to get a lot of a lot of education and class time, you, you can't go wrong with a camp. You'll mm -hmm. just learn a lot from it. If you can make a week of it, spend a few days at the camp, then you have a day or two off from camp before the race starts, and it gives you a chance to play around with your equipment some more and to fine tune things. And then by the time you show up on race day. There isn't going to be a question in your mind whether you're ready to go out and race your bike. Like you'll you'll feel 100% comfortable, and that you can survive, and that you can that. Yeah, and that you can survive. Yeah, because you'll have already done the things that you'll need to do while you're out there riding your bike. So, uh, yeah, I I definitely would do the camp too, even though I live yeah. in a snowy area. <laughs> yeah, I just yeah. think <laughs> learning those survival skills is pretty. Yeah, important. Yep. the survival skills and how to deal with certain situations. And, you know, like, I mean, like, what do we all do? You know, as, as ultra endurance athletes, we all go out and buy, you know, if we buy one thing, we buy three other things just like it because we didn't like the first one. But like, it gives you an opportunity to, to weed through like a bunch of that stuff when you're at camp, because you'll see everybody and you'll see their equipment, how they're using it. And, and you'll talk with people firsthand that have an extraordinary success rate at ultra events. And, and how they manage situations with specific equipment. It's just, it's amazing. It's amazing. Cool. Any other questions?